Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Hope you're doing well. Today, I thought we'd have a look at another little part exchange beauty. It only cost us a thousand pounds, this thing. It's quite the machine, really. It looks like a lot of car for a grand, but it's not completely without its problems. So I thought it might be interesting to have a look at what features you can get in a car for a thousand pounds. And then I guess we'll need to sort a couple of things with it and see if we can't get it sold on. So I'll pull this thing out and we'll take a look around it. Right, so here we have it. Hopefully you can see that okay with the light out here. We are looking at a Jeep Cherokee limited edition. It's 2006 and it actually looks pretty damn good. It's obviously been well looked after by the looks of it. The bodywork all looks really good. It looks quite nice and black. The wheels look in pretty good condition. On the whole, I mean, that looks pretty damn good for a thousand pounds, I reckon. But we will walk around it and check out every part of it and then take it for a road test, figure out what it might need in order to get this sold, and then figure out how much we think we might make from this deal. So some things I can tell you, it's on 117,000 miles. As I say, it's a 2006 on a 56 plate, and it came in part exchange for a thousand pounds against, it was definitely a Range Rover. I can't remember if it was a Range Rover Sport or a, Dis no, it was the Black Evoque that you probably saw me buy in another video and we ended up having to put a new DPF on it. That is what they've bought, and this is what they've been driving around in. Let's have a look. We've got a Nexon Radian HTX on the front with absolutely loads of tread. Let's say, bodywork all looks in pretty good condition. We've got Grand Cherokee on the door, and then the limited edition badge there. We've got a Jinju Gross Pro, or oh, Cross Pro, sorry. <laughs> uh, again, loads of tread, not premium brands we're looking at here but you know they are in good condition paintwork's actually really nice hopefully you'll be able to see it if i go close here it's got a real nice metallic flake in it and the paintwork is very dusty right now because as i always say the beach is just over there so we get all the sand and everything but you can tell looking through i mean look if i sort of do one of those things where you go in on it it can almost be just like a slightly blurry picture and then look at that this is someone who loves and looks after his car. Praises it almost, like sweet Jesus. This was owned by a church man. We've got tow bar on the back. Everything on the back looks all right. It's a CRD, so I assume that means it's the 2.8. And it's got an Overland badge. I honestly don't know what that relates to. Is that a brand of something? I don't know. We have got roof bars with some little crossbars on there. Handy, I suppose. We've got another Jinju on the back. Again, really good tread. And then I'm hoping we're gonna have a, we have. We've got a Nexon Radial HDX. I assume this must be a four x four, but with a two wheel drive option, because otherwise you'd want matching tires on corners, but it probably, I don't know. It might drive around in two wheel drive most of the time, but it might not, I don't know. But I actually can't fault bodywork anywhere. This might be the tidiest Jeep. I've ever had. Even the bumper, there's no cracks or anything in it. It's pretty damn good actually, isn't it? Even the headlights don't look, well, they're a little bit faded on top there. Quick polish over with a bit of heavy compound. That'll be back to like brand new. So there's not really much to talk about on the outside. It's really good condition. So we better have a look inside. We have got two keys as well as I guess these are for the roof bar type things. Our remote central locking does work, which is a plus. The door's a bit... Oh, that's clipping. That's interesting. Wonder why that is. Does that all line up? Looks like it lines up okay there. Lines up okay there. So I wonder why. Maybe the hinge has dropped a little bit. Yeah, the door does look a little bit lower than the wing, but it's just catching. Not too bad, but I'm sure we could adjust those hinges slightly. So we've got half leather interior with this Overland thing. I'm gonna to have to look that up actually. I guess that must be like a, you know, like a trim level maybe. We've got half leather, half, I guess it would have been Alcantara suede type thing. It's very, jeep looking very american looking actually that old style before it became sort of jeep fiat we've got cruise control automatic gearbox we've got the 
Quadra Drive 2 installed in this bad boy. I assume we are in four-wheel drive constant because we've got a four-wheel drive low selection. And then, yeah, that's about it. There's no options for going from four-wheel drive to two-wheel drive. So I don't know what that means for tyres and how they should have been fitted or whatever, whether that's okay or not. But I guess the fact that they're all on a similar amount of tread and everything will help. Um, we've got a not so pleasant looking wood trim veneer thing in a few places. Sort of thing you would expect in a Jeep, again on the steering wheel, but it is electronically adjusted and we do have heated seats as well. We've got our kind of head unit display thing up here, which we'll get to in a minute, but we've got cruise control. I've already said that. Uh, sorry, I should say it's climate control, uh, parking sensors. It's all really nice and clean and tidy in here. We have got a sunroof, which looks like it opens as well. Any sunglasses in here? No, sadly not. Very Mercedes looking style. We've got the visual things at the front there for your parking sensors. We've got Boston premium audio in here. So I think when I move this around, it had classical FM blaring, to be honest, but it did sound very crisp and nice. It looks like we're gonna have absolutely stacks of paperwork to go through. This is someone who really takes care of their car. We've got the locking wheel nut thing in there. We've got the books here. We've got the V5 as well as the service book and everything down here. Excuse me if I'm not getting this in shot every time. New camera and I'm not that good with it. What have we got in the armrest? So we've got a little sort of net cubby hole thing. I don't know what that's designed to be for. It's got like little slots for something. I don't know. Uh, two cup holders in the front here. Yeah, there's a load of interesting stuff in the back. Before we hop in the back, let's have a quick look in the boot. Is it a split system thing? Don't think so. So what's that on there? Is that like a lock for the wiper? That's odd. Look at that. It's like pristine. It should be in a museum or something. Even the parcel shelf is just like mint condition. Very rarely you see that, and it retracts as it should. Right, we're gonna have some kind of interesting load spacing in here, a very American type stuff. So we've got like hook pin things there, I guess. That would work with these ones as well, so you can strap stuff in, I guess. You got more things there. What are we gonna have under here? Not another row of seats, surely. Oh, okay, so that's the locks. So we lift those, twist them like that. And then, oh, we've got some Jeep center caps. So we've got a full set of rubber floor mats there. And this thing, I guess you could take out and use as something else. It's got like a plastic checker plate type thing. It's quite handy. Is there anything else to be accessed under there? No, I don't think we can get to anything else under there, but obviously our rear seats would fold down. And for 2006, we have got a power outlet in the back, which was quite modern for its time, I would suggest. God, it must have had some new, gas struts in there at some point because that was quite hard to shut now where i think this car comes into its own is in the back so let's hop in there and have a look what we've got i gotta say actually with that driver's seat back because it's one of those things that pushes itself back when you get out and then when you get in it just does this and like mashes you into the dashboard i hate when cars do that just stay in one position i think we can all live with that we don't really need it to be that much more complicated. So let's check out our center armrest. Oh, so given the game away there, we've got center armrest with cubby holes. We've got headphones. What could that possibly be for? We've got a very early 2000s style fold down TV screen. Look at that. And then up in there is our remote control. That all comes down to this system down here which is a DVD, I can turn it on probably. Maybe not without the ignition on. I don't know if I've got a DVD to hand, but I noticed when I checked this out the other day that our remote control and our headphones are all missing batteries and they all seem to have had batteries in them for quite some time. You know when batteries get that kind of like green, blue schmegums that leaks out of them? Uh, it's definitely had that. It's obviously not a very high resolution TV thing in here, but it is quite, a cool feature, I think. Anyway, that folds down in the back. You've got these comfy seats, which were these electronically adjusted as well? No, sadly not. You are stuck in the one position. But yeah, I think that's quite cool. And then 
hadn't spotted before either, there is your cup holders for the back. It's just like really impressively good condition, this thing. I obviously didn't figure out very well how to fold these headphones away last time. Will that do it? Yes. There we go. Now, I think that's, it doesn't look like it's shut, but it is. So while the screen in the back definitely works, I've had that on. Uh, this radio, if we turn our ignition on, we'll get classic music. But we do not get any display, and I've tried all sorts. It just doesn't seem to want to work now. Oh, we've mucked it up now. We have got navigation on here as well, judging by the nav button. Let's try and get it back to radio. It's a problem now, I won't know what mode we're on now that I've pressed that and we don't have an operating screen. With any luck, we can plug in and find out why that isn't coming on. Maybe we can just tell it to turn on, I don't know, but I fear that it will need a new head unit. It's interesting, it says navigation disc here. The only way you can access it is by this little tab on the end. How do you... I don't know, I'm going to break my nail off. Other than that, I think it does fire up pretty well, so let's give it a, a blast. A bit of a lazy start, but not too bad. It's asking us if we want the English language, but you might have spotted our oil warning light is on. Now we knew about that when we took it in part exchange and the chap seems to think that it is just a sensor. But if I was trying to get rid of a problematic car, that's probably what I would say as well. So we will need to plug this in and find out what's going on with that and what's going on with the head unit. I'm fairly certain the air conditioning, oh, I was about to say the air conditioning is ice cold in this thing, but actually if I press the button, it flashes at me and ah, oh, it's interesting because it's definitely coming out like icy cold air conditioned on the left hand side the right hand side not so much actually so maybe there's a fault there because i remember being in here and thinking that is nice cold air conditioning it's definitely working but i think it's only coming out the left hand side so maybe that's telling us there's a fault with the flaps or something. Let's cut this off, have a look under the bonnet, and then we will look at the paperwork before we head out on the road. And one thing this reminds me of is this key is a bit of a nightmare. And why is it with American things there's always something weird? You know the ones that have got like a button next to them you have to push in order to... Ah, oh, just a, such a pain. But this just doesn't seem to want to... Okay, so you've just got to like really... It's like the door lock on my house. It's just a nightmare. You've got to really jiggle it and you can tell it's been a problem because look, that key is bent from some, someone's been yanking it and getting frustrated with it. Right, here we are. The three litre CRD in fact is that, that might be the better engine. That might be the Mercedes lump. I could be wrong. I won't research it. You'll just have to let me know in the comments because I can guarantee the shifting metal fans will know the difference. You guys are very knowledgeable. So I think the 2.8 is the kind of Jeep American GM, whatever it is. And the 3 litre is based off of the Mercedes 3 litre V6 diesel, which is probably the one you want to have. So that would be good news if I'm not talking absolute rubbish, which is possible. I'm hoping, oh, it does look very black, but then it is a diesel. I thought that might have been like, crispy clean because there is a stack of paperwork in there and the general condition of the car i expected that this would have been serviced to within an inch of its life that's a bit of a nuisance oil cap that to be honest but we are back on now let's have a quick look at our coolant can't really see much in there but we can see from the level on the side it does look full but on the whole it does all look quite nice and tidy under there got a massive gap back here for god knows what this cable 
which feels like a poor design if that's really how it just flaps around but it's probably not meant to yeah it all looks pretty good doesn't it all ties in with the rest of the car which seems to be pretty good condition let's hop in and have a look at the paperwork as i say we have got two keys which is always nice to have we've got our v5 which tells us that it's had five previous keepers so six in total we've got our last mot certificate which gives us mot until march the 20th 2025 something to do with the tax it had a mass airflow sensor in april 2023 at the cost of 193 pounds 74 replaced turbo at the cost of 1794 pounds and 32 pence back in 2022 so they've spent twice as much on this car as we gave them for it in the last couple of years diagnostic check it was costing 55 pounds and 20 pence one glow plug module won't affect running two boost codes relate to the turbo actuator motor and gearbox fails which is really common on these i guess that's why it then went on to somewhere else and had the turbo changed sensor that's interesting supply and fit new oil pressure switch when was that 2021 so has he had this problem before at 109,201 miles and we're now on 117,472 and it's gone again is that why he's so confident that's what it is did it clear it for a couple of years three years i guess and now it's come back on that's why he thinks that will be interesting how much did they charge for that they charged 170 pounds and 75 pence they charged 98 pounds 29 for the sensor it'll be interesting to find out how much we can get one for won't it uh, abs sensor in 21 tpms sensor unit abs sensor battery which is the one that's still in there that was changed 2020 first service i'm coming across which was in 2020 256 pounds for that service let's have a look another tire and our purchase sale which is obviously left in there from where let me make sure we cover up this chap's details a thousand pounds for those of you who ever question when i say how much we actually pay for cars and they're like, oh yeah you never paid that much for it or you obviously paid more and you're just doing clickbait there's the signed document let's hope that in this owner's manual here is some service history yes it is usually kind of it, i thought there would be because if we've got this a book in that plastic folder it means because there's service history in there otherwise we wouldn't be carrying around just general owner's book for no reason so Glyn Hopkin Limited seems to be the first service in here, which was at 11,800 miles. Yeah, just seems to be the first. Then, same place again, 25,721. What have we got here? Oh, they stamped it in the wrong place. Something weird's gone on here. They've sort of written in one and then written, stamped it across another. We've got two, four, six, six services in total. The last one being in 2020 on 101,000 miles. So, due a service, really. And that was at CJK Vehicle Repairs, which no longer exists. That was just up the road in Highbridge. They closed down and it's now changed into something else. A&E, not a hospital. That's the name of their garage. And then it was sold by the looks of it because it says sales service. I don't know what that means. Does that mean it's just flush some oil through it? Uh, JSW Garage Limited in Kings Lynn. So it's due a service, but we have got service history. So that's good news. It's making weird creaking noises at me. I have no idea what this is worth, to be honest. Should we have a quick look at Auto Trader? In fact, rather than look at Auto Trader, we can probably kill two birds with one stone here and have a look at vehicle score. Then we can get a score for this vehicle. We can look at the MOT history. We can see the value estimator and future value estimator as well. So I need our registration, which is Kilo Juliet 56. Juliet Hotel Echo. Check car. It's going to give us a score from 1 to 999. It scores 638 out of 999, which is considered not bad. Two below average, apparently. That takes into account the age of the vehicle, the mileage of the vehicle, its MOT history, and loads of other factors to give you that kind of free score to tell you how good that car might be. It tells us it's got an 81% uh, MOT pass rate. Should we check whether it's ULS compliant? I doubt it. No. Looking good. Long-term owner. Last MOT had no comments. Recent MOT pass rate is high. Bad bits. Vehicles over 10 years old. Mileage is above 100,000. MOT history. Let's have a look at that. 
So past, past, any details on those? No advisories. What did it fail on last time? Headlamp, previous failure to that was a headlamp as well. Another headlamp. It's actually got a pretty good MOT history by the looks of it. Vehicle details and performance. So it's a three litre diesel. Other really handy features on vehicle score, of course, is your vehicle tracker, which is this section here. Shows that the mileage has always gone up or at least stayed the same and hasn't dipped down, which might indicate that the car had been clocked. Tap to reveal our performance. 214 horsepower, top speed of 124 miles per hour and a 0 to 60 speed of nine seconds, which is actually pretty impressive for some of this. But what isn't as impressive is the 12 months tax score, which may well kill this car. It's probably why the value is absolutely tanked out of it. Because 12 months to tax this on the Great British Roads will cost you £735. That's 73.5% the total value of this vehicle. Crazy. How much is this car worth right now? Get my instant valuation. Takes you to Auto Trader. Let's put our registration in then. See how this Auto Trader thing works via vehicle score. Kilo Juliet 56. Juliet Hotel Echo. And our mileage is 117, let's say 500 as the display has gone blank. They've identified the car, but they can't tell us how much it is because it's over 15 years old. Now, if you are buying this, even if you're only spending a thousand pounds on it, it's well worth doing a background check on it. And that's why I really like using Vehicle Score. Not only do they have their free checks, they've also got their paid reports as well, which will tell you an absolute multitude of things about a car you'd want to know before you hand over your hard-earned cash because it is going to massively affect the value. So you could go with their £2.97 salvage report. You could do their ultimate report which is £8.97. What I like to use is the Ultimate Plus, which gives you £10,000 worth of data guarantee on top. That costs £11.97, which is an incredible price for a check that is this thorough, definitely one of the cheapest on the market. I can make it even cheaper for you as well if you use my code SHIFTINGMETAL20. And in fact, that's what we're gonna do now, run through a purchase on this. What I'm gonna do is hit that thing at the top there. It says promo code SHIFTINGMETAL20, add that, and it makes it just £9.58. I'm gonna use Apple Pay. Couldn't be easier, and it will now go through and process and give us our report. So here is our report. Let's have a quick look through it. Looks like we've got all green ticks other than for plate change. So no certificate for destruction, no outstanding finance, which is a big one you need to check. No insurance category, not a high risk vehicle, no color change, no salvage record, not stolen, not an ex taxi, not scrapped, and it's not an import or an export. It also tells us that it's had five previous owners, which we knew from having the V5. But if you were looking at this car, you wouldn't necessarily know that in advance. It will also now give us our valuations, which it says on a dealer forecourt, this should be £3,852. So we are absolutely quids in. Trade in poor condition is 1348 Trade average is 1570 And if you're looking to buy this privately, the average would be about two and a half grand. That all seems to add up, I think. If we could get two and a half grand for this, which, do you know what? I can't see any reason why we couldn't if we can sort these two little issues because it's a cracker, we will be laughing. Just one more really cool thing I like about Vehicle Score as well is if you're watching this video 20 days after I've done this paid report, you'll be able to put this registration in and look at the full report for yourself as it shows today. It'll give you all of that information as well as all the raw data that's on here as well. If you're a computer whiz, unlike me, and you can do something useful with that. So highly recommend you visit vehiclescore.co.uk before you're looking at buying a car and don't forget my code SHIFTINGMETAL20. Let's get this thing out on the road and see how it drives because that's going to be the real acid test. Now I know a lot of you were saying, oh you shouldn't drive that with the oil warning light on, but the other chap's been driving this around for a long time like this. So don't think that me driving it for a short while is going to affect it, especially if it is just a sensor. But I guess we'll find out. I only want to do a quick journey anyway, just to find out how it drives, if there's any major problems that I think I'm going to want to get sorted, like knocking ball joints like that. Is that a drop link maybe? It's a bit of a nuisance, but I guess. Yeah, so that's near side going over a pothole. I don't know if driver sides. I want some drop links never usually that lucky and it needs like a lower arm or something and i bet on something like this jeep they'll be bloody expensive and they'll be hard to come across as well i didn't notice before but it doesn't surprise me in this car for some reason i don't know why it feels like the type of car that would have it there's a warning sticker here saying warning onboard cctv operating in this vehicle which means they probably had a dash camera it's a bit of an exaggeration to call it cctv but there you are Don't know what it's upset about, beeping away. 
unless it's telling us about our oil pressure. Maybe it does it when you come to a stop. No, nope, not sure what that was about. Maybe someone got up my butt and it was setting off my parking sensors. It feels like a big old unit, this thing. It's like driving your house. It's amazing how much more refined 4x4s and SUVs have become over the last 18 years since this was sold because just feel how rigid they are. I almost feel like it's trying to chuck me out of the seat when I'm going around a corner because the whole thing just feels so firm. God, it's dead. To, that's my foot flat to the floor. It really does not want to... It's picking up now. I wonder if we're still having issues with our turbo. Because for something that's 214 horsepower, all right, I imagine this probably is about 8.5 tonnes. But... I can't feel any boost actually, which is disappointing. It's gonna be more issues to sort out. I did notice that this gearbox has got a manual select option by going left and right. So left down to second gear We're at 2000 RPM. I would say we're not getting much turbo boost there to be honest which is disappointing it's the sort of thing you wouldn't really notice it too much unless you were looking for it I don't think but yeah it does feel pretty goddamn dead to the world excuse my blasphemy especially in this oh holy vehicle not that you told us about the lack of power in it it just doesn't I mean it is picking up speed but yeah, it feels like it's got a bungee cord on the back of it. Or someone's locked a brake on. And that knock's getting a lot worse at speed, isn't it? Now, we might find that the fact that the oil pressure switch, whatever, is cutting power to the turbo. But it makes sense, because if you were low, you know, oil pressure, if it was leaking through the turbo or something, it wouldn't want to just boost and run away. Don't know. So think we've probably mm, it's about to say brake seem okay but actually it's felt like it kind of turned to the right then under braking this was all going so well to start off with let's try it in a straight down on a fairly level bit of ground you know let's dive into the right so we will need to look into that as well this is the joys if you were to be retailing cars of this sort of just about swing it. Price. It's luck of the draw. You may get a car that needs minimal repairs, maybe one or two little things to get sorted for it to be retail ready, but you may get one like this sort of thing, just random American stuff. And parts are expensive. So they just start getting away from you. And once you've done one thing, you realise that something else needs doing. And it's just these little bits and just little bits just to try and make it perfect. And this thing's never going to be perfect, especially if it ends up, you know, God knows how much a head unit is for one of these. But I guarantee it won't be cheap because there won't be that many of them. That's why the value's fallen out the arse of them. Because they're not really good enough to bother with, I'm afraid to say. Give me a Disco 3 of the same era and it will be like night and day. It'll be like driving a pedal car versus driving a Rolls Royce. It's just, they're just not, not that good. It's a bit pants, really. It looks quite cool from the outside, I have to say. And I like the look and idea of a Jeep, but the reality is they're just crap. So I think we'll get this back to the garage. I doubt they'll have a chance to look at it today, unfortunately, because we are quite busy, but sooner rather than later I want them to plug it in see if they can get this head unit working have a look see what that knock is all about the oil pressure sensor switchy thing and find out why it's low on power and decide whether we're actually going to fix those things and try and sell this for two and a half three thousand pounds I think it would be fairly sensible in good nick with everything working or just accept that it's going to be too much work to try and get everything right 
and trade it on for 1500 quid and let someone else have some fun with it. So the next time you see me, I will either be stood in front of a clean, shiny Jeep in our showroom saying how we managed to fix everything and how cheap it was and why it was such a good idea for us to get it fixed and to sell it, or I'll probably be sat in the office explaining why we just traded it on. That may be, I think, in reality, a week from this point. But with the magic of YouTube, that will be now. Right, so we are back in the Jeep Cherokee, Jeep Grand Cherokee even, and we are down the farm, as you probably have seen already, because this thing is done and dusted now. It's down here. It's been probably a few weeks since we last talked about this car. But I can now tell you that the radio head unit has been replaced, and that is now working. And we've also changed the oil pressure switch. The guys reconnected a few different things that they needed to that was disconnected underneath. I think all just in order to get the car to drive how they wanted it with that oil pressure switch being an issue. That has now been changed. We did try buying a cheapish one that was about 15, 20 quid, I think. That was a Jeep, like an aftermarket one, but it looked identical to what we ended up buying, which was a genuine Jeep Chrysler one for a hundred pounds. Expensive, but it did fix the problem. So can't really argue on that front, I guess. When it comes to the radio, we had to order one from America. So it, that's why it's taken us a little bit longer. This was sitting around at Bear Motors for longer than I wanted it to. It's the sort of thing you've got to take into account when you're buying something a little bit quirky. I mean, Jeep Grand Cherokee doesn't seem that quirky, does it? But if it's, you know, not really like a domestic market product, it's from America, then if you want to buy cheap parts, we'll get hold of secondhand parts on an older car. It's probably going to be tricky or you have to have a bit of a delay while you get it from America. So we did get a whole new head unit, which I will show you now. Oh, it's just going to mash me into the dashboard a minute. I hate when cars do that. Let's get this door shut. Stop the... Bing bong. And there we have our head unit. Uh, the one thing we don't have is the navigation disc. I think what happened was uh, when they took they took the other one out without having taken the disc out. So we'd have to like smash up the disc. Well, actually it's saying that. I think it's in the glove box. But either way, I'm sure we could order one, but I don't think it's going to matter too much. I don't even know. Nav. Please insert DVD ROM. Well, we don't have one, or if we do, it doesn't work. So we've got CD, disc changer, six changer, haven't we? And then what have we got radio, like that. Very exciting stuff. I'll tell you what, I will get up the prices of what we've actually spent on this because the car itself was a thousand pounds and it drove okay, didn't it? It just had those couple of little quirks. Both of these items came from eBay, so I should be able to find them. Right, okay, so I take it back. I lied. The head unit wasn't quite as expensive as I thought. I think there was a lot of options they were looking at, and they were to get a Jeep head unit um, for a Grand Cherokee. They would have had to get one from America for about 250 quid. But I think Dan spent a bit of time digging around and figured out that a Chrysler 300C... Let me show you on here. Hopefully you can see that okay. Head unit was exactly the same, basically. Same part numbers, um, but it was just marketed as a Chrysler 300C. I guess there's a lot more of those in this country. Uh, so that was £110 plus four quid of postage, basically. That was the cheap oil pressure switch. Hopefully you can see that. £10.76. That one didn't do the trick, sadly. So then we had to buy the £99.99 pence one. So what did this car end up owing us? It ended up owing us £1,314, which I still think is a bargain. What do we say? We think we probably could have got two and a half grand for this. So there's still well over £1,000 of profit. But what Sophie has actually done already, hence why I've come down here to film this at the farm just to get it done before it disappears and ruins a video, she has done a part exchange deal on this. Uh, she is getting £1,600 for the car. So that covers it with a £290 profit, let's say, a little bit less. And she's getting a Kia Sorento, which is a 4x4, isn't it? For some reason, I've got a complete blank when she said this to me. It's on 160,000 miles. It does have a long... I don't know. 
Right. That is interesting. Suddenly decided it was going to start moving me around in the seat just because I leant back. That's strange. Let's just double check because she said this Kia that she was getting is a 4x4. And I said it's entirely up to her if she wants to take it in part exchange. There's profit on this car either way, so I'm not too fast. Is this a Sorento 4x4? I'm not a Kia expert. I need James from Chops Garage to give me all the Kia information. Hey, let's just say that it is. I'm fairly certain it's a little SUV. Um, so she's got one of those coming, 160,000 miles. Um, it does have MOT, but it's got a pretty poor MOT advisory list, including things for like coolant leak, etc., etc. Maybe I'll do a video on that as well, if it's really bad. She was like, oh, what about this? And I said, I wouldn't, but if you want to, go ahead. So she has gone ahead in typical woman style. There we are. That is it. So this car is done, completed. Uh, a little bit of profit in it, plus we're getting a part exchange, which, you know, hopefully, which is getting for 600 quid. So that's not the end of the world, is it? So what do we say? We're getting £1,600 for this. We would have got £2,200 if you consider that part exchange to be worthy of what she's paying for it. So not a bad investment at all. What will you have got? About 900 quid out of it. And I'm quite happy with that. It's quite a cool little thing. So that is it for this video. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, make sure you give it a thumbs up. It really helped me out. Make sure you subscribe. We have reached our 75,000 subscriber target. Therefore, by the time you watch this video, I probably will have given away the Tag Heuer watch. But that said, if you feel like you've missed out on winning that £2,000 Tag Heuer watch that I was giving away when my subscribers reached 75,000, don't worry because we're going to run something very similar. So just get on board now, subscribe, and you'll already be in it to win it. That is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.